Hi, thanks again for joining with me today as we're going to have a time in the Word together. I'd like for us to begin with a word of prayer, asking God the Holy Spirit to help us in our understanding of His Word to us today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. And God, as we come together today in this time in your Word, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, to open up our hearts and our minds to understand and to receive all that you have for us. We thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Today we're going to be going to Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to be uh, talking about the Lord and His great love for us. Last Sunday, we talked about celebrating communion. And in celebrating communion, we're rejoicing in what Jesus has accomplished for us through the cross. Uh, but at the same time, we're also remembering that He has promised to come again to take us to be with Him for all eternity. So when we think about communion and remembering Jesus' great sacrifice for us, there's always that little bit of of sorrow or grief in what he went through, but yet there's great rejoicing in what he has accomplished for us. So we're going to be in Colossians uh, chapter 1 again this morning, and we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 20. And so if you have your Bibles, if you will find that passage of Scripture, again, it's Colossians chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 15 through 20. I also want us to remember that while we are waiting for this great promise of Christ coming again, we need to know and to remember that right now He's watching over us as His people, His church. He is watching over us, but He is also interceding on our behalf before God the Father. In the book of Hebrews, the seventh chapter and the 25th verse tells us this, that He is able to save completely those who come to God through Him because He always lives to intercede for them. So by our faith in Christ, He is able to save us completely. The uh, New English Standard Version or the English Standard Version that we use says He's able to save us to the uttermost. The NIV, New International Version, says He's able to save us completely. So there's nothing in our life that is beyond God's power to redeem and to restore. So He is able to save us completely. No sin in our past that God won't forgive. No broken heart that He won't mend. God is truly on our side. He is interceding for us. So with that in mind, let's go to Colossians chapter 1, and we'll read verses 15 through 20 today. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, this is referring to Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven, and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. These are some very powerful verses. They are just full of wonderful insight and meaning for us as believers. And I would just encourage you to take some time after this morning's message just to read those verses and think about them and contemplate them and then rejoice that what God is saying to us is for our benefit and for His glory. Uh, the point that Paul is, uh, seeks to make is that in Christ, the invisible God becomes visible. 
If you ever wonder what God the Father is like, you just need to read the Gospels and see Jesus, how he interacted with people, how he taught them, how he loved them, how he ministered to them. And that's exactly how God the Father wants to minister to us. So in Christ, the invisible God became visible so that we can see and know who God the Father truly is. He, he shares the same substance as God and makes God's character known. So if you ever wonder what God the Father is really like, just look at Jesus. It, verse 15 says he is the firstborn, and it mentions it a couple times in this passage about Jesus being the firstborn. And that can be for us a confusing statement about Jesus. Some uh, religious groups talk about Jesus being a created being or the first creation of God. But Jesus is God. He was God. He always was God and he always will be God. But when we receive this verse in verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. To know a little bit about uh, Jewish background under the Old Covenant, the firstborn son was the son of most importance. He was the one who would take over at the passing of the father to oversee and safeguard the family and provide uh, for that family physically and financially and in all of those ways. So the firstborn refers to first in privilege or first in priority. And so as, as a, the firstborn son in a Jewish family, he was the one in management of the, the whole household. So when we see Jesus referred to as the firstborn, it means he is the one who is in management of God's divine family. It is to distinguish Jesus from creation. He, he is not a created being and he's not part of creation. He is beyond creation. So this, this, if he was a created being, the idea of the firstborn or the birthright would not be applicable to Jesus. But because he is the, the only son of God, he holds that position of uh, being the firstborn of all creation. In verse 16, it says, And by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So as we look at this verse, we see Jesus as the creator. Again, he is not part of creation. He is above creation because he is the one who has created all that exists. When it says it's by him, it means it is of him or of his mind. He is the one who thought all of this and planned this and brought it in. In other words, the responsibility for creation was his. He conceived the idea of creation with all of its complexities. This is attributed to Jesus Christ. In other words, think of it this way. Jesus was the detailer of creation. All of the details, the magnificence of creation and all of the wonderful things that mankind has been seeking to discover uh, since he created us. So he is the detailer. The father is the architect. And, and I'm trying to make this in such a way that it's easy for us or easier for us to understand. So Jesus came up with all of the ideas and the details and the intricacies of creation. The father then becomes the architect who draws the plans, who puts it all together. And God the Holy Spirit is uh, the, has the work of accomplishing what Jesus has created, what the Father has drawn up the plans, if you please. And so the Holy Spirit then becomes the one who works and, and accomplish it. In other words, he puts the plans into application. And this is part of the mystery of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, 
one God, yet three personalities within that Godhead. And so this is how creation came to be. So it talks about creation was by him, and then it says it was through him. What that means is when creation is through Jesus Christ, it is by his power and his ability that it all comes together. So it was by him, it was through him. And a couple of passages of scripture that will help us with that. If we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and you may be familiar with these verses, but John, the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and the first three verses, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him not anything made that was made. So Jesus is God, and he was the instrument or the person of creation who made all things. And then in the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3 in Hebrews chapter 1 says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint or representation of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Again, Jesus is pointed out as being eternally God and also the creator of all things. So it was created by him and through him. And then in Colossians, it says it was for him or he created all these things unto him. Uh, think of it this way, that Jesus is the goal of all creation. He is the center point of all that exists. He rules over creation, and it's all for his glory and the glory of God the Father. So Jesus is in control of that which he has created. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17, it says, And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You ever been in a situation or a circumstance where you have heard someone say, or maybe someone has even said it to you or they've said it to me, get it together. You know, kind of get a grip. In other words, you take control of what's going on in your life. They're calling you to do something in, in a positive way. So just, just get it together. In other words, you, you've, you've got to come together with this thing. And oftentimes when people say that to us, we don't even feel like we can get it together. We feel like things are out of control and beyond our scope or ability to kind of bring them back into order. Verse 17 gives us great assurance that Jesus Christ holds all things together. This world is not out of his control. He gives mankind the freedom to make choices. And oftentimes those choices are very poor or even bad or disastrous choices when they're made outside of the wisdom and knowledge and will of God. But Jesus is holding all things together, the creation of the natural world. We just read that in Hebrews chapter 1, that he holds all things together by his powerful word. We don't need to panic in our circumstances. God is in control. If you and I have placed our faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, the world around us seems chaotic. It seems out of control, but not for God. 
And we can rest assured that he holds us in the palm of his hands and he is interceding for us at this very time. A couple of scriptures I want us to take a look at. The first one is in Psalm 135, the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, chapter 135, and looking at verse 7. It says, it is he, he it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. The psalmist is writing about God is in control of all creation. It's talking about the natural world. God is also in control of the spiritual world. God is also in control of the physical world. And so we can be at great peace because God is at control or in control of those situations. In the New Testament, in the book of Mark, the fourth chapter, we read the account of Jesus in the boat after a long period of ministry and he tells his disciples to get in the boat and they're going to sail across uh, the Sea of Galilee to the other side and in the midst of their travel in the boat, a ferocious storm comes up and the wind is blowing and it's in opposition to them and the, the waves are crashing over the boat and it's filling with water and the disciples are busy bailing and trying to get the boat under control of the storm. So finally they wake up Jesus and they say, don't you care that we are going to drown? They're, they're panic stricken. And Jesus gets up and he rebukes the winds and the waves and he commands them to be calm and immediately after his command, the wind cease and the water begins to settle. Now, when this happens, the disciples become fearful and they're asking themselves that who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They were marveling that Jesus could speak and the sea and the storm calmed itself. Again, he holds all things together by his powerful word. Friends, he's able to help us hold it together. When we read his word and we pray and we ask for his strength, God is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine. So we, we give it to him. We give our lives to him and he holds our lives together as we live in obedience and we trust his word. God has the power to carry it out. We are safe in his hands. We take our faith in Jesus and he gives us the courage and those two things working together will make us to be able to get through any difficulty that we face. So every aspect of creation, we know from practical experience and from the word of God that every aspect of creation was touched by sin. And here's the good news. And every aspect of creation will be touched by the grace of God. As much as the world has been impacted by sin, God has so planned it that every aspect of this world will be touched by his grace. And what I mean by that is this, that God's grace are going to replace everything into its proper position. God's grace will replace everything back into its proper position. In Romans chapter 8, the book of Romans, the 8th chapter, if we go down to verse 18, and we'll read through verse 25. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. 
that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Paul is writing and giving us better understanding to what we read in Colossians chapter 1. And here again, let me say this. Every aspect of creation that was touched by sin will be touched by grace. That grace puts all things back into proper position. The curse will be lifted off creation and it will know the freedom that we have as sons and daughters of God. We have been touched by grace and been reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, put back into proper position. So grace received brings restoration. We were restored as sons and daughters of God. We were restored or reconciled with God the Father. Grace rejected, however, will bring judgment and condemnation. In other words, when we reject the grace of God, there is no other option other than judgment and condemnation. That's why God's grace is such a wonderful thing because it places us back in right position with God. Back to Colossians 1 and let's look at verse 18. And he, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We are the church. He is the head over us. And, and, and let me just try and use this to help illustrate that. The head is the center of the intellect. Our brains are there. And so what we think gives us direction on how to live life. Jesus is the head of the church. He is directing the church. If we will but listen to him and read his word, he gives us the direction that we need. It, he, is, it, he gives us the information as the head of the church. In other words, he tells us where we need to put our attention, where we need to focus for our lives individually, for our uh, church as a church body, where the church needs to be involved in the aspect of our society and creation. It is the central, he is the central part. In other words, he is the control center. As the head of the church, Jesus should be our control center, giving us health and, and protection, providing for us. So Jesus knows how to watch over us. And he is watching over us. He isn't gone on vacation. He hasn't abandoned us to our own wisdom and intellect. But Jesus has become the head of the church. What this also tells us is that we are dependent upon him. Just as much as our physical body is dependent upon our head, the nervous system, the thought processes to know when to reach for a glass of water or the ability to do things. We are dependent upon Jesus Christ. And as the body of the Lord, we are interdependent upon one another. We need each other. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, the eye can't say to the ear, I have no need of you, and the hand can't say to the foot, I have no need of you. We need each other, and Jesus is the head of the church, and so together we become the visible body of Christ to those around us. Just as much as Jesus became the exact imprint of God the Father, the visible manifestation of God, you and I are the visible manifestation of Jesus. 
That's an important thing to remember. So as the world sees us, the challenge for us is do they see Jesus in word and in action in attitude and how we respond to others. And as this verse says that Jesus is the head of the church, that he might be preeminent, that he might have the supremacy. So everything, Jesus needs to be preeminent. What that means is that he's above all else. He is superior to all else. He has authority over all things. He is the sovereign. And so when it says he's the firstborn from the dead, in other words, he is the preeminent one. He was the first one that was resurrected to eternal life. Everyone else that was raised in scripture had to die a second time. His friend Lazarus, whom he loved, Jesus called him out of the tomb, but Lazarus died again. But Jesus rose forever. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in its own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. So as we see here, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. And so finally in verse 20, it says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So now we're reconciled to God through the blood of Jesus. And the great news is we have peace with God the Father. And we can have peace with each other if we will just live the way God tells us to live. We are secure in him and we must put on the full armor of God and to stand firm in what God has provided through Jesus Christ. He is watching over us. We can rejoice in him and we are secure in Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your son. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that we're secure in you, that you are making us to be the men and women of God that you've called us to be. And in every situation, we are secure because you intercede for us and you hold us in the palm of your hand. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me today. Have a good day. Bye-bye.